We've been in a series entitled Revolutionaries. Everyone say revolutionaries. And sometimes God gives me messages for a series, and then sometimes God gives me series for a message. And this series, Revolutionaries, has been to get us to today, to get us to this point, to get us to this place in time where we can move forward together in faith and in victory. And so today I want to share with you uh, for a moment from the subject matter, the great desperation, the great desperation. And so if you're watching online, I want you to annoy the heck out of one of your social friends, tag them, ping them, share this message with them, let them know we're live right now, put in the chats where you're watching from. And I believe God has something in store for us today. I'm a firm believer that where there is expectation and anticipation, God always provides something supernatural. How many of you know throughout the Word of God, He was not moved by tears, but He was moved by faith. And so today I'm going to ask that you would stretch your faith antennas, stretch your faith uh, antennas to the frequency of heaven so that we can see what God sees and hear, what God is saying. I also want to remind those that are leaning into this moment, July 10th, everyone say July 10th. We're going to be serving our city on Serve Day. And so we are not a church that is just in the city, but we are a church of the city, for the city. And so we're not just here to get fat off the word of God and have a nice little golf club community here, come on Sunday, see our friends, go home and not have an impact in the city. We're here of the city, for the city, to make an impact in the city of Jacksonville and every other city that we're in. And so I'm going to ask you to go on the Celebration app, sign up to join us in serving the city to make sure that we are a representation of the kingdom of God and that this region sees uh, a move of God because we said yes. Amen. I'm going to be in Habakkuk, Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 1. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 1. I'm going to read, and then we'll pray, and then we'll unpack. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 1 says, I will climb my watchtower, and I'll wait to see what the Lord will tell me to say and what answer he will give to my complaint. The Lord gave me this answer. Write down clearly on tablets what I reveal to you so that it can be read at a glance. For the revelation awaits an appointed time and it shall speak. It will not prove false. Though it lingers, wait for it. And it will certainly come and will not delay. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your presence, God, and we declare in the company of our brother and sisters that we want to be where your presence is. And where your presence is not, we don't desire to go. And so, God, we ask that you would dwell with us in this place or wherever we may be watching from today. We ask that you would change us, transform us, wreck us from the inside out. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. The great desperation. In October 24, 1929, most people know it as Black Thursday. It was the beginning of the Great Depression. I was intrigued by this as a young boy kind of reading books and doing some study on it in school and was trying to wrap my head around how did things get so bad. And I've come to learn that in the Roaring Twenties, when the economy was resurging after war, uh, the men from war would come back home and would go and get jobs and apply for loans for houses. And because the men were at war, the women would go out and get jobs, which created more opportunities for more people. And the economy began to bust at the seams. Jobs became available. Uh, cars were created by Henry Ford, uh, livestock, agriculture 
was being farmed at a speed that humanity had not seen before because the demand was so large. And not only that, people were making more money than they knew what to do with it, so they began to invest it in the stock market. Then the stock market began to surge and began to take off, and because people wanted more stocks, they began to take out loans to put into the stock exchange. Well, the banks wanted to get in on this as well, so they began to borrow money. They began to send out more loans. They began to also invest their money in the stock exchange. And what began to happen in October of 1929 is, uh, as the stock exchange was surging, the jobs stopped being available. And the liquid cash economy was drying up and getting depleted. And it was happening at such an alarming rate where the stock market was surging, but the economy was plummeting, that on October 24th, 1929, this alarming rate of panic ensued, and everyone started pulling out of the stock market at the same time. In 1929, they say, on that particular Thursday, $64 million was pulled out of the stock market, which in 1929 is equivalent to billions of dollars now. That following Tuesday, they said another $116 million was pulled out of the stock market, plummeting the economy, sending us into what we now know as the Great Depression. The Great Depression. People waiting in bread lines, people waiting in clothing lines, people waiting uh, in lines to receive bags of rice who uh, a month before that were considered to be affluent. People doing things out of the norm to survive because of this great depression. On the back end of the great depression, one of the greatest revivals broke out and we begin to see a move of God in this country and in countries around the world because of what took place. If you do history research and dig through some of the greatest awakenings and revivals throughout humanity, you will always see a trend. They always come on the back end of some of the greatest hardship. Revival awakenings always come on the back end of the greatest desperations. The word of God teaches us that Jesus provides what it is that we have need of. In the Old Testament, God says, I am that I am. What he's telling you is, he is what you need him to be and so much more. And I believe that we are on the cusp. I believe that we are on the edge. I believe that we are right on the verge of seeing the greatest move of God because we have come through one of the greatest seasons of desperation that we have ever seen. In Habakkuk chapter 2, beginning at verse 1, we read this narrative of Habakkuk in a place of desperation. At this particular day and time, Babylon was running this region and pushing the children of Israel out. And Habakkuk was confused as to how God could let this happen. How these people that were barbarians could be wreaking havoc on the people of God. If we're to put a pin right here, have you ever asked the question, if God was so good, why do these things happen? Right? It's okay, you're in a safe place today. I know you put your Christian face on every week and you come in and you speak your church your knees. But when you go home and you're in your closet by yourself, you have questions that no one can give you answers to but God. Have you ever thought to yourself, if God is so good, why do we go through the things that we go through? And the reality is this. It's because of the love of God. I know that sounds strange. I know that sounds weird. But God loves us so much, he gives us the ability to choose to love him in return. But not only just to love him, he gives us the choice to choose. And it is up to us how we choose to live our lives. Sometimes people choose to do bad things. And sometimes people choose to do the right thing. Habakkuk is in this time He's in this region, he's seeing these things unfold and take place, and he has questions for God. 
And he begins to cry out to God because he is desperate. He understands that if I continue to do what I'm doing spiritually, I won't see anything change. And isn't it strange that we believe that we can experience a move of God doing the same thing that we've been doing? Isn't it crazy how we think we can experience something that we've never experienced before doing the same exact thing that we've been doing for years? The greatest awakenings, the greatest revivals comes from a group of people who have not abdicated their role in the body of Christ that sees the rest of the church being woed to sleep by what's around them. That is willing to stand on the front line and be revolutionaries to what it is that they see. A revolutionary is an advocate or a person that is willing to do something different than the cultural norm. What we see right now are people that are ingrained in culture that have made what they believe based upon how they feel. We see a group of people that sometimes picks up the Bible, sometimes prays, sometimes depends on Jesus, sometimes do the things that they know they should be doing when it is some things that they need or hoping for. I'm not talking about the people without Christ. I'm talking about the people that supposedly walk with them. As I told you at the beginning of this series, the average Christian, the average Bible-believing, Christ-confessing Christian spends seven minutes in prayer a week. Seven minutes. That's the cultural norm. That's, that's the society normality of how much time people that confess to be believers spend in prayer. We have to be revolutionaries. We have to stand on the front lines. We have to push back the gates of hell. We have to stand in the dark places and shine the light that needs to be shined so that we could see things happen that we've been praying for. It's one thing to say something. as something completely different than do it. The Word of God teaches us that we cannot just be hearers of the Word of God, but we also have to be doers of the Word of God. Habakkuk has brought himself to the place where he no longer wants to just hear what God is saying. He wants to carry out in action what God has instructed him to do. And my prayer for us is that we would become a people that not only hears what God is doing, but take the necessary actionable steps to carry out what God is doing. And in order to do that, we have to push beyond our comfort and actually go into something called conviction. What are your convictions? Right? What are your convictions? What are your godly convictions? What are the things that you hold on to that God has told you don't let go of? I want you to ask yourself that question. What is it that I carry as a conviction? Because we make excuses for everything. Right? We make excuses for everything. We want life to be so convenient. We live in an instant society, in an instant culture, where we want what we want it, when we want it, and how we want it. And if we don't get it that way, we don't want it no more the way that we wanted it once before. You know how we want church now? We want church to fit our schedule. Oh, 2020, oh, it made things real comfortable for us. Just click on a button, watch church whenever you want to. Press pause on it, say, I'm going to come back to you. Forget about it. Next week rolls around. Click on it. Three minutes into it, click off of it, see what's on the news. We've lost the conviction. We, we've lost the holy hunger. We've lost the desperation until something happens. I want us to get to the place where we have a desperation for God before something happens. I want us to get to the place where we're hungry for more of his presence before we have to be. I want us to get to the place where we understand not only do we need more of Jesus, but we want more of Jesus. This isn't something that we have to do. This is something that we get to do. What are your convictions? As I mentioned to you before, unless you were kidnapped and drugged here, you know where you came. You know you came to church. You may not have wanted to come. Your girlfriend may have brought you here, and you may be thinking, man, this is going to really seal the deal. This is it. She sees me in church. She sees me lifting my hands. Boom, we in there good. <laughs> However you may have got here, 
you're here now. And unless you run out now, you got to hear this crazy man speak for about 20 more minutes. But you know where you came. And you have some idea of why you came. You didn't come for yourself to save yourself. You came because you was in need of a savior that could save you from things that you can't save yourself from. You came because you were looking for a healer that could heal you from things you can't heal yourself from. You came expecting to experience a deliverer that would deliver you from some things that you don't have the power or the ability to deliver yourself from. You know where you came to. We don't go to a bowling alley to skate. You know where you go to. You don't go to a restaurant to people watch. You go to a mall for that. You know where you go to. Nobody goes to a restaurant, sits down, order, look at the food, pays, gives a tip, then walks away. Man, that food looked really good, didn't it? It did. Whew, man. Did you smell that snake? It was incredible, right? Oh, my gosh. Did you see that glass of water I had? It looked thirst quenching. Each cube in there was just shaved right how I like it. It was amazing. Did you eat any of it? No, I just looked at it. You can smell it? Absolutely, it smelled incredible. Oh, I wish you could have smelled the mashed potatoes. It had butter just melting on the top of it. You didn't eat any of it? No. But did you smell it? Absolutely, oh my gosh, let me tell you about the salad. Ah, the salad had ranch dressing. It had croutons, homemade croutons. You know, the soft kind, not the crunchy time that takes your teeth off, the soft croutons. <laughs> and you didn't try it? No, I didn't. I just looked at it. Have you ever had that conversation before? No. If you did, slap that person upside their head. <laughs> Tell them, give the money to you next time before they go spend it at a restaurant. But as crazy as that sounds, that's how we look in the spirit when we come to church and we have this food in front of us and we have this presence in front of us and we have the oil of the Holy Spirit flowing in front of us and we just look at it and we don't participate in receiving and giving. We look crazy. Don't come without getting what you came for. Don't come without getting what you came for. You know where you are at and you know that you have great needs and there's only one person that can provide the needs that you have and his name is Jesus. Habakkuk understands there's something that I have need of so I have to do what's necessary to get what it is that I need. I'm desperate and there's a great desperation I believe is forming in the earth right now. It's a great awakening, a great revival that we are about to see. And my prayer is that we don't miss it because these windows in time only come on occasion. And if you miss this window of opportunity, you have to wait to the next one. And the reality is most of these windows don't happen multiple times in the lifespan of people. And so I want us to look at this life of Habakkuk. I want us to see what he did. I want us to take note of it because it can point us in the right direction. The first thing scripture tells us that he did, it says that he withdrew. In order for you to understand what it is that God desires and to hear the voice of God, you have to withdraw. You have to go to your secret place. I like to call it the phone booth. Clark Kent would go in his phone booth. He would shut the door no quicker than he could shut it. He was back out again as Superman. You got to find that place where it's just you and Jesus. You have to find that place where it's just you and the Spirit of God. You have to find that place where it's just you and God's presence. You have to find that place where you withdraw to. And you have to stay long enough to create a memory. Listen to me. Because we only go back to the place where we have a memory. The reason a lot of us don't enjoy spending time with God 
is because we haven't created memories with him. In order for you to withdraw, you have to make sacrifices. Hear me when I say this, if you can't sacrifice it, you've become a slave to it. I'll say that again, if you cannot sacrifice it, you've become a slave to it. And anything that you've become a slave to not only steals your time, but it owns your time. The reason we have problems with drawing, unplugging, pulling away is because we've become a slave to something that we don't even know we've become a slave to. In order for us to experience the presence of God the way he desires for us to, we have to withdraw long enough to create a memory. The reason we enjoy vacation is because it reminds us of a vacation that we took before. The reason we enjoy doing the things that we enjoy doing is because it's attached to a memory that we either remember consciously or subconsciously. You have to stay in the secret place long enough to create a memory. Do you understand that the memory God gives you is one of the only things that the enemy can't steal from you? Habakkuk said, let me withdraw. Let me go to the watchtower. Let me go be a watchman on the wall. Let me sit and wait. Let me withdraw. Let me get alone with God. When is the last time you set aside intentional time to get alone with God? I'm not talking about the convenient relationship where you just with the crazy kids in the back and you praying, God help me. God help me not to kill him this week in Jesus' name. Oh my God. I'm talking about the intentional alone time with God where you withdraw to get poured back into so that you can deal with them crazy kids. And not only live and act like Christ, but react like Christ too. You got to withdraw. Satan cannot steal your memories. And so it's important that you get away in the secret place long enough to create one. It's important that you get away in the secret place long enough to create a memory that will sustain you in your rough seasons. The prodigal son knew where to go back to because of his memory. He got his possessions stolen, but he still had his memory. His friends left him, but he still had his memory. He lost everything that he had acquired, but he still had his memory. He knew where to return to because of a memory. When you spend time in the presence of your father, it doesn't matter what happens to you, you always know where you can go back to because of your memory. Is there anybody grateful that God desires to spend time with you alone to give you a memory with him so you know where to return to when things get tough? You have to withdraw long enough to create a memory. In Philippians, it says, put on the mind of Christ. Allow his mind to swap with your mind and consider it not robbery to call the mind that you now have his. You have to withdraw long enough to create a memory. The second thing that we see Habakkuk do this is something that we hate doing. He waited. We don't like waiting because we believe waiting time is wasted time. We live in a society that tells you I'll sleep when I die. You got to hustle to get out there and get it. You got to grind yourself to the bone to get the life that you, no, you just need to wait. Word of God says wait on the Lord and be of good courage, again, I say, wait. We don't want to wait long enough for the instructions that God has for us. So we would rather spend our life trying to figure it out. Habakkuk withdrew, and he waited. I love what Scripture says in Psalm chapter 46, verse 10. It says, be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. The reason we're not hearing the voice of God is because we're too busy moving. 
We live in such a transient society. We, we got to go, 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 go. We got to make it happen, make it happen, make it happen. And God is saying, can you be still long enough to get the instructions from me so that you can run in the direction I have called you to run into? Habakkuk not only withdrew, but he waited on God. Everyone say that I have to wait. You see how much you enjoy saying that. Three people. Everyone say I have to wait. We have to wait on God. In Psalm 62, verse 5, it says, For God alone my soul waits in silence. 2 Kings chapter 3, verse 15, Elijah asked for soft music to be played while he waited to inquire of God. You may be in here and you may be asking this very important question, how long should I wait? Well, I'm glad you asked. You should wait long enough to receive his command. You should wait long enough to receive his command. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 6, Scripture says, Therefore thou shalt keep thy commandments of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways and to fear him. When we read that word fear, we think to be afraid of, to be fearful of, to be fretful of, when in fact this terminology is to reverence. We have to wait long enough to receive the command from God because we reverence him and his time. Let's wait on God. We should wait long enough to receive his commands. The majority of us only wait long enough to finish our prayer. I know that's tough to hear, but the majority of us only wait long enough to finish our prayer. We only wait long enough to finish what we're saying to God and not give God time enough to respond. We have to wait long enough to get the command from God and be obedient to what he commanded us to do so that we can run in the direction that he desires for us to run into and not spend our life spinning our wheels based off of what we think we're supposed to do, but actually have a blueprint to how we can accomplish what he created us to do. How long should we wait? Number two, we have to wait long enough for hope to be birthed again. We have to stay long enough in his presence for hope to be birthed again, for faith to be recharged again, for our energy to be recharged again. We have to stay in his presence long enough to experience his presence. Look at what scripture says in Psalm chapter 119, verse 81. It says, my soul fainted for thy salvation, but I hope in thy word. We have to stay long enough for hope to be birthed again. How long should we wait? Number three, we have to wait, we have to stay long enough to become broken. And this is the part that we don't like. Because oftentimes when we pray, we're praying for somebody else. Let's be honest. Spouses, talk to me for a second. How many times have you prayed that God would change your spouse? You don't have to say amen. I know they're sitting right beside you. But I know. Oh, I know. How many times have you prayed that God would change your boss? That God would change your coworker? That God would change someone other than yourself because we don't stay long enough in the presence of God to be broken by God. Because in order for us to be broken, that means God has to position us to see who we really are. We don't like who we really are. So we create these identities of who we want people to think that we are. And let me tell you something, the people that are talking about you, the people that you think are hating on you, they don't hate you, they hate who they think you are. We don't want to stay in the presence of God long enough to be broken because then we actually have to see who we've become. When's the last time you've taken a hard look at who you've become? Think about that for a second. We don't like waiting in the presence of God because we really don't want to see 
who we've become. It's not until we get broken in his presence that we can be who he created us to be. I want you to understand this. He's not going to judge you based off of what you do. He's going to judge you based off of what he told you to do. We don't discover the ramifications of that, though, until we are broken in his presence. There's something so beautiful about being broken in his presence. About allowing him to remove everything that does not reflect or image him out of us. And place in us more of his presence and power so that we can be who he equipped for us to be. Habakkuk understood I have to withdraw and I have to wait until I stay in his presence long enough to be broken. The third thing that Habakkuk did that we can take note of is this. He watched. I love this. He says, I will look to see what he says to me. He didn't say, I will hear what he says to me. I will look to see what he says to me. And I believe he said this. I want you to listen to me real, real clearly right here because oftentimes God will speak to you through what you see. Not only was Habakkuk listening, but Habakkuk was watching because he understood not only does God want to speak to my ears, he wants to speak to my heart. So I have to withdraw, I have to wait, I have to watch, I have to be on guard, I have to have my spirit in tune to what God is saying and what God is speaking and what God is showing me because if I miss this window of opportunity, I miss a window to see what God has called me to do in being who it is he's called me to be and I can't afford to miss this window of opportunity. And so I will stay. I'll wait, I'll watch. There's very few things in my life I enjoy more than people watching. I mean, Jenna's doing her thing. Me and Max are sitting in the car. We'll just watch people. He said, Daddy, look at them. I said, I know, look at them. They look crazy, don't it?" <laughs> say, why is hat like that? I don't know. People watch. Just watching people go throughout their day. But I also like watching the presence of God move amongst his people. And so in worship, you'll see me turn to the crowd to see the presence of God moving amongst his people. Why? Because God not only wants to speak to my ears, but he also wants to speak to my eyes. He wants us to know that what I am doing for the person sitting beside you is readily available for what I desire to do in and through you if you'll let me do it. And there's something so powerful and supernatural about having your faith activated by what you see God doing someone else. That's why the word of God says we overcome by the blood of the lamb and by the words of our testimony because God not only wants to speak to you through what you hear, but he also wants to speak to you through what you see. If you can see God move faithfully on behalf of someone else, it builds your faith to understand and know God can do the same thing for me. He's no respecter of person. What he's done for others, he can do for you. Habakkuk withdrew, he, he waited, then he watched, and then the fourth thing that he did, I love this, I love this, it says that he wrote. It says, the Lord gave him answer. Write down clearly what I revealed to you. Write it down. See, in order for your faith to be encouraged, in order for the spark to be lit again, you have to write down what it is that God speaks to you because if he knows that you value his word by writing it down, he'll continue to give you his voice. One of the worst things for me is to give someone valuable information and they don't listen to it. What it tells me, what it's an indicator of, is they don't really believe that what I'm telling them is possible. And God looks at us the same way when he speaks life into us and we don't write it down. He says, ah, man, I'm not going to stop speaking, but because of the lack of honor, you will stop hearing. Because God is always speaking. But I'm telling you, his voice flows in the direction of honor. And when we don't spend time writing down the things that God shares with us, he never stops speaking. 
But the lack of honor blocks our ability to hear. And so we think God's no longer talking to me. God no longer cares about me. God no longer is speaking to me. No, he's still speaking. But because of the lack of honor, you've stopped hearing. And the only way to get it back is to start writing down the things that it is that you've heard in the past. Because nothing can take you back to the presence of God like a memory. And so Habakkuk, he withdrew, he, he waited, he watched, he wrote. And the last thing, this is where I want us to land. He worshiped. Oh, he worshiped. He understood, God, I can't make it on my own. I, I can't make it in my own power. I can't make it in my own strength. I, I know what I want to do, but God, what is it that you want me to do? I know what, what I want is my way, but God, what is your way? I want to do what it is you want me to do, God. And worship, it's an indicator that you understand that you are not your own God. You know why some people have a hard time worshiping? It's because they believe that they have the answers. They believe that they are their own God. They believe that they are the ones that got themselves in the position that they are in. They believe that they're the ones who brought their family together. They believe that they're the ones who worked hard for the job that they have. When the reality is you can't work hard enough for the job you got. The reality is you're not good enough for the family you have. The reality is you're not good enough to make it on your own. The only person that can do that is a savior. And when you identify and understand that you're not the person who got you to this place, but it was only Jesus, then you don't have a problem worshiping him. See, it's only a savior that can save. It's only a healer that can heal. It's only a deliverer that can deliver you in your own ability, in your own power. You can't do it, but there's one who can, and his name is Jesus. And the word of God teaches us that his name is great and greatly to be praised. So I wonder, am I talking to anybody, whether you're online or in the room, that understands and identifies, I didn't get myself to this place. I couldn't bring myself out. I couldn't heal myself. I couldn't deliver myself. I couldn't save myself. Only Jesus could do that. And so I don't mind lifting up my hands and opening up my mouth and saying, Lord, thank you. God, I will withdraw. God, I will wait. God, I will watch. God, I will write. And God, I will worship. Not by my might, not by my power, but by the might and power of the Spirit of the Lord is the only reason you have your life live and move and have your being. back understood I have to withdraw I have to I have to wait I have to watch I have to write and I have to worship he says in chapter 3 verse 2 oh Lord now I've heard you report and I worship you and I love this and the message translation it says God I've heard of what our ancestors say about you. And I'm stopped in my tracks and I'm down on my knees. Do among us what you did amongst them. And my prayers for us today is that there will be a great desperation that cries out from this place. And our prayer is God, do in us what you have done in our forefathers. Allow us to see revival. Allow us to see awakening. Allow us to see the supernatural. Allow us to see miracles, signs, and wonders. The way you showed your sons and your daughters in the Bible, he's not a respecter person. And what he did for them, he has the ability to do the same thing for you. Is there anybody that will take the next minute to cry out to God? and say, God, I will withdraw. God, I will wait. God, I will watch. I will write and I will worship. Come on, lift those hands. Come on, lift those hands. God, we're desperate. We've come to the end of ourselves. We don't want to do this, God, without you. And so right now, in the name of Jesus, we ask that you would change us. And God, we ask that your spirit and your presence will go and touch those 
who we prayed for earlier and God touch those who are listening to me right now that need a fresh and filling of you and so right now if you're listening to me and you desire to withdraw you desire to wait you desire to watch you desire to write you desire to worship God in a way that you never have before I want you to throw those hands up I want to pray with you I want to pray for you I want you to repeat this after me Lord Jesus I'm running back to you I'm desperate for you I don't want to live this life without your presence I desperately need to see your power I'm hungry for your, for your glory, God. And God, I ask that you would change my heart from the inside out. I confess with my mouth and I believe with my heart and I believe with my heart and I believe with my heart that you are my risen savior. In Jesus' name, 